Hello, fellow teachers. This is Teaching with Power, and my goal is to help you teach the scriptures with more relevancy and impact. As you watch, if you like what you hear and see, please like, subscribe, and share. And this week, we're going to cover 2 Corinthians chapters 8 through 13. For an icebreaker, I would talk about water, and I would show them a picture of a dam and ask, why do we build dams? And they could give a number of answers, like uh, they create lakes for recreation or for irrigation. But hopefully somebody is going to give one of the major purposes of building a dam, and that is power. They generate power. Then you ask, how do dams generate power? The answer is that water naturally seeks equilibrium. If water is in a high place and it's given an outlet, then that water will flow into a lower place until it finds balance again. And as it flows, it generates power. And if you were teaching a younger audience, you could easily turn this into an object lesson. You'd need two watertight containers, one small and another one big. I would use like a milk jug or one of those ice cream buckets for the small container, and then maybe a see-through storage bin for the other. Now you fill the smaller container with water and then place it in the bottom of the storage bin. Then tell them that the smaller bucket represents a large lake being held back by a dam. That water is in a state of balance. But what happens if you poke a hole in the bottom of that pail? Then go ahead and poke a hole in it. Then let them watch the water flow until it finds balance once again in the bottom of the larger container. Be sure to point out that power is being generated in the flow. They're going to be able to see it pushing out and creating waves and ripples as it flows. And then you could ask them the same questions that were already mentioned. Then you make the comparison by saying, we live in a world of inequalities. Some people just have more than others. They're higher in status or position. They're like the water behind the dam. And others have less and occupy a lower position. They're downstream from the dam and have very little. But what if those in the higher position decide to open the floodgates of generosity and give of their abundance to those downstream? What happens? Power is created. There is power in giving and in generosity. Then you transition by saying, keep this in mind as we study 2 Corinthians chapters 8 through 9. At this time, there were many saints in Jerusalem that, because of famine and war and persecution, were suffering and poor. So the church leaders, including Paul, were making a special effort to collect funds from the other branches of the church to help the suffering saints in Judea. Earlier, the saints in Corinth had promised that they would make a contribution to help. So in 2 Corinthians 8-9, through 9, Paul reminds them of that promise and then teaches them some very powerful principles on generosity. What are those principles? Well, to help your students find them, you're going to give them a little challenge. I call it, just say it in plain English, Paul. We all know that Paul is a little bit hard to understand, so this is a good exercise to try to learn how to interpret him better. So you show them the following slide and challenge them to pick one of the verses and translate its meaning into their own words. And then give an example of how a person could live that principle today. And there's three different levels they could choose from depending on how confident they feel in translating Paul. You've got easy, intermediate, and hard. For the easy, chapter 8, verse 11. Intermediate, chapter 9, verse 7. And for the hard, chapter 8, verses 13 through 15. And I find this really helps people to rise to the expectation. When they, when they feel challenged, they put in a little more effort. So let's go through these together. Chapter 8, verse 11 says, Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. In plain English, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, don't just be willing to help, actually help. Don't just be sorry for people and then say, well, somebody really ought to do something about that. You be the one to help them. Do something. Do what is in your power. How could somebody live that today? Pay a generous fast offering, contribute to the church's humanitarian aid program, or some other reputable charity. It also doesn't have to be just about money. Where do you see need? Do others need friendship, comfort, support, your prayers, your time? Don't just sit there and think that somebody ought to do something about it. You be that somebody. Like Paul says in chapter 8, verse 24, Wherefore, shew ye to them, and before the churches, the proof of your love, and of our boasting on your behalf. You say you love your fellow man and want to help them? Prove it. Chapter 9, verse 7, 
Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. In plain English, you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Don't do it reluctantly or because you feel you have to. God loves those who give willingly and cheerfully. And how could somebody live that principle today? Seek to have the proper attitude when you do give. Now, I think giving with the wrong attitude is still better than not giving at all, but you're missing out on the real blessings of generosity. It feels good to give. I remember when I was a teenager that we went to visit a hospital around Christmas time for a young men's, young women's activity. And I went, but I did not really have that great of an attitude. I wasn't super excited about going. And I remember that there was another young man about my age who was also going. Now, he wasn't very active, and according to my unrighteous judgment, I didn't think very highly of him. And he just happened to be wearing a really nice jacket that evening. Well, we visited the room of a boy with a mental disability, and this young man just ran over and talked to him and cheered him up and really made an effort to make him feel better. We eventually moved on to another room, but that young man stayed behind and spent more time with that boy. And after about five to 10 minutes, we stepped out into the hallway and I looked down the hall and there was this young man pushing the mentally disabled boy down the hallway in a wheelchair with that boy wearing his jacket and beaming with the largest smile I've ever seen. And the only other smile that could match his was the smile on that young man's face. He'd made that boy's day. He was a cheerful giver. And because of that, he walked away from that experience much more blessed than I was. If you look at the verse just prior to this one, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. I think that means that those who give more, get more out of it. At that hospital, I gave sparingly, so my experience was spare. That other young man gave bountifully, and he left bountifully blessed. Now for the harder one, 8, 13 through 15. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. In plain English, God doesn't want you to give so that other people can take it easy while your life is made harder, but to make things more equal. Right now, your plenty can supply their lack, so that your lack can be supplied by them. Like the scriptures say, he that has the most had nothing left over, while he who had the least was not in want. Now this leads us back to the damn principle. I mean, (laughs) be careful how you say that in class. Uh, Maybe I should say the principle of the damn. It's good for those with abundance to give willingly and cheerfully of that abundance. And in the church, it's not about taking from the rich and giving to the poor. It's about supplying and helping people in their times of want to help them to get back on their feet until they can be self-reliant once again. Now, as the bishop, I oversee the welfare program in my ward. And I'll admit to you that I was really intimidated to take on that role when I was first called. But now it's one of the most amazing things about the calling, especially when a member of my ward comes into me And I know that they have been faithfully paying their tithing and fast offerings for years, but now they've fallen on a hard time, a job loss, a major medical expense, or some other financial crisis. And it's so cool to look at them and say, you've blessed the lives of many others through your sacrifices over the years. You've given freely and cheerfully, but now is the time to receive and to be blessed by others. It's a beautiful balance that we have in the church. When you give to others, there is something that they give to you. Not only in that financial way, but there's an abundance of joy and satisfaction when we give. It feels good to give. And to see the blessings that our giving creates in the lives of others is an edifying experience. Just as water generates power as it seeks balance, generosity generates power in both directions as something is given. You might ask your class, have you ever felt the power of giving? And what was it like? Then, have you ever felt the power of receiving? And what was that like? And you see, both sides are blessed. Some may wonder why God didn't make us all financially equal to begin with, with some rich and many poor. Perhaps we look heavenward and say, hey, that's not fair. 
And he calls back down to us and says, you're right. That's good. You're developing a sense of justice. Now get out there and make things more equal. I also like the analogy of the house with two doors. Imagine a large house. That house represents a family's needs and righteous wants. But what do we do when that gets full? What if we start to bring forth in abundance? We've got quite a problem here. There's no more room for our abundance. It's the same problem encountered by the rich fool back in the Gospels. His solution was to build bigger barns to fit in all of his abundance. God says that this is a foolish solution. And I'm sure you've seen this. Those that have more than enough get to the point that they don't even know what to do with all they've been blessed with. So what do they do? They buy bigger houses full of rooms they don't even use, nicer and nicer cars, and in general, they spend more and more extravagantly. But is there another solution to our house problem? Yes, open up the back door and start to shovel the abundance out. And how do we shovel it out? Uh, tithing, fast offerings, humanitarian aid, the missionary fund, direct help to struggling family and friends, disaster relief efforts, charities that help those in developing countries. There are many opportunities to give. And you know what often happens when there's somebody that's willing to shovel out the back door? I think God says to himself, well, here's a rare individual, somebody that can be satisfied with enough and willing to give of their abundance. Let's bless them even more. And so God starts shoveling the blessings in more quickly into his front door. So what do you do? Shovel it out the back just as quickly. And in that shoveling, power is generated. And remember, this doesn't have to be all about money. We can be blessed abundantly in many different ways. So you can continue to help them apply these truths by asking, if you were to evaluate your generosity, what grade would you give yourself from A to F? And then what could you do this week to raise your grade? Pay a more generous fast offering? Visit an aging relative? Attend a service project willingly and cheerfully? Be the first to raise your hand when a volunteer assignment is announced in church? Provide disaster relief? Be a friend to the friendless? Mourn with those that mourn? Comfort those that stand in need of comfort? Pray for an opportunity to serve and help someone? The possibilities are endless. Life isn't fair. The world is not set up fairly, but that means that there are ample opportunities to create power through generosity. And then you can perhaps conclude with this final thought. Since we've been talking about water, what happens to a lake with no outlet that only takes and never gives? Two bodies of water come to mind, the Great Salt Lake in Utah and the Dead Sea in Israel. What has happened to them? They die. They become lifeless, barren, and bleak. Don't let this happen to you spiritually. Like you used to sing in primary, give said the little stream, and then hurry down the hill to bless other people. I promise that as you do, you will find joy and power in the giving. Now moving on to 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13. For an icebreaker, perhaps you just ask a simple discussion question. When is it right to show tough love? And when you ask this, be sure to give them some time to think. There may be some silence as they ponder their answer to that question. But if you're patient, more often than not, the responses will start to appear. And then transition to the scriptures with 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13 are a good example of tough love from an apostle. False prophets had begun to infiltrate the church in Corinth and had beguiled a number of the members. Because Paul was not as eloquent, attractive, or rich as many of these chiefest apostles, as he called them, some members had begun to criticize Paul and call his authority into question. These chapters are Paul's defense of his apostleship. And to me, these chapters are really sad. They almost make me want to cry because I just think the world of Paul, he's my hero. And to see him reduced to this is really a shame. He had served and sacrificed so much for these people. And then they turn around and treat him like this. I mean, they really hit below the belt. You'll see how low they go, but, but Paul really lets them have it. It's a brilliant defense, and frankly, it's a little prickly. So let's dive in. I struggled to come up with a way to really turn this section into some kind of search activity. So I gave up, and I'm just going to walk you through these chapters, hitting what I think are the most significant parts. And you know, sometimes that's not a half-bad teaching technique. 
I don't do it very often. I don't want to be a lecturer. But with Paul, sometimes you just have to plow into it and tackle him head on. But then we'll end with some suggestions or questions that you could ask to, to spark a discussion. So let's start with the criticisms. What are some of the things that people were saying about Paul that is causing him to have to defend himself? So you could pick students to read these references one by one and then comment on what they mean. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. You can almost imagine him using air quotes around those words, base and bold. What they're saying is that he's timid in person, but bold in his letters when at a safe distance. Chapter 10, verse 10. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So they're saying he writes well, his letters are powerful, but he's kind of unimpressive in real life. He's not much to look at, and he's not that great of a speaker. And actually, for this one, let me give you the physical description of Paul that Joseph Smith gives us. Apparently, he had either met Paul or had seen him in a vision. But Joseph says this about him. He's about five foot high, very dark hair, dark complexion, dark skin, large Roman nose, sharp face, small black eyes, penetrating as eternity, round shoulders, a whining voice, except when elevated, and then it almost resembles the roaring of a lion. So did you catch that? He's only five feet tall. He's just a little guy with a big nose, small beady eyes, and a whiny voice. So you can see why maybe the people didn't think much of Paul in person. They're judging him by the outward appearance. He even accuses them of this in chapter 10, verse 7. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. So he's saying, you think I'm not really an apostle because of how I look? So you see, they're really sinking to a pretty low level here. Chapter 11, verse 6. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been truly made manifest among you in all things. So here, another criticism of his speaking ability. He's rude or, or unpolished in his speech. Paul is willing to admit that here. But then he assures them that he's not rude in knowledge. I may not talk pretty, but I'm a smart guy. And then this next criticism really blows me away. I really don't get it. It's chapter 11, verses 7 through 12. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And that doesn't mean he's stealing from anybody. He's, he's just relying on different members of the church, uh, the ones in Macedonia, rather than, rather than the ones in Corinth. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. What they're saying is that he's not really an apostle because he isn't supported financially by the church. He's not willing to take their money to support his basic needs. He's allowing the Macedonians to do this, but with the Corinthians, he doesn't want to give them any excuse to accuse him, which kind of tells you that he's probably doing this because he knows how critical the Corinthians can be. He was afraid that they would accuse him of preaching for money. But now they're criticizing him for not taking their money. He just can't win with them. So he says, are you offended because I didn't let you support me financially? Because I didn't take your money? So let's go back and pull out a few verses here and there to see how Paul defends himself. Back to chapter 10, starting in verses 2 through 5. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Uh, we don't fight the way the world does. They fight dirty. They use manipulation and boasting and deception. But we fight fair. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, 
and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Um, we use godly weapons. We use the truth to cut through the lies and anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Then jump to verse 8. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. So we apostles are sent to build you up, not tear you down. So if I write tough love type letters to you, it's because I love you and I want what's best for you. Verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So we don't do what the world does. We aren't boasters of our own selves. We don't commend and compare and rank ourselves the way the world does. We have a different way of doing things. But just a quick side note here. What's funny is that Paul is going to do just that here in the next chapter, but in an ironic, sarcastic way. So chapter 11 begins with this. Would to God that you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. So uh, I'm going to be a little foolish here. Bear with me, guys. Verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I care about you guys. I'm jealous over you. Like a father, I wanted to marry you to Christ in purity. I'm afraid you're being deceived and pulled away from the simple truths of the gospel of Christ. Verse 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. So you guys seem to put up with anybody who comes along and preaches a different Christ or different gospel. He, he's referring to these false apostles or chiefest apostles. If you can put up with them, then you should be able to put up with me. I think I'm just as qualified as they are. So after that, he goes into those verses explaining why he wouldn't take their money. But the false apostles are charging them money. So in verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Uh, these guys that are charging you for their preaching and setting themselves up as a light, they're deceiving you. They may appear good on the outside, but inside, they're working for the adversary. And now he's really going to get into it. Verse 16. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Okay, guys, I'm going to be a fool for a minute. So he's saying, okay, guys, I'm going to be a fool for a minute. I'm going to boast of myself a little. I'm not speaking in God's way right now, because God's leaders don't need to boast of themselves. But this may be the only way to get through to you. It reminds me of Paul's statement back in 1 Corinthians 9, where he says he would become anything to anyone to win souls to Christ. To the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. So here it's like he's saying, I become as a fool to the fools, so that I might gain the fools. So he's really getting wound up now. Verse 18, Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. So, you seem to tolerate impostors and fools readily. When people come along and take your money and boast of themselves, you take it and love it. Even if they hit you in the face, you bear it willingly. So you love boasting? All right, I'll give you boasting. I'm speaking as a fool here, but let's do it. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm more. So he's like, 
I'm everything they are and more. I'm going to one-up them on this one. In labors more abundant, I work harder than they do. In stripes above measure, I've been persecuted more than they have. In prisons more frequent, in deaths oft, I've suffered much more than they have. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Uh, that whole last section is a rhetorical device. With that length and that repetition, it's meant to tire them out mentally. Like, look at all that I've been through. And then, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Not only have I been through all that, I've also had the burden of responsibility for all the churches in this area. Who is weak, and I'm not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? And on top of all that, I have my inner emotional suffering when I watch others suffering or when I see them deceived. Jump over to chapter 12 now. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. What about revelations and visions? I've had plenty of those too. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And the man he's talking about here is himself in the third person. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for men to utter. Apparently, Paul had a vision of the celestial kingdom. He knew what heaven was like. So, you chief apostles out there, have you seen the celestial kingdom before? And then Paul has one more thing to boast of. Verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Apparently, there was something about Paul's appearance that worried him. He calls it his thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it is. Some think that it could have been something about his eyes or his eyesight because of a verse in Galatians um, 4.15, which says, Wherefore I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Whatever it was, it was something that troubled him, and he asked God to take it away three times. And what was God's answer? Verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So God's answer was, don't worry about it, Paul. I'll make sure that it doesn't affect the effectiveness of your work. My grace will make up the difference. So you don't need this infirmity taken away from you. In fact, because you have it, you have to rely on me. And you'll have my grace, and my grace will make you stronger. And knowing Paul, I imagine the only reason he would have asked for something like that to be taken away would not be about self-concern or vanity, but probably because he felt it would make him a better missionary. Maybe he felt it got in the way. He just wanted to be the best missionary that he could be. And this is really a good example of a time when even somebody with great faith and with pure intentions asked for some kind of blessing of healing and was not given it. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we would like him to. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love us, but it could mean that his grace is sufficient to get us through it. Our infirmities bring the powers of Christ upon us to help us, and we are in turn blessed through that help, maybe even more so than if we were to have our thorns in the flesh be removed. Verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So, 
if I have anything else to boast of, I'm going to boast of my weaknesses. I'm going to boast of my infirmities because it's actually them that make me stronger. Verses 11 and 12. I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. I think that here Paul's saying, I didn't want to do this. I've made a fool of myself in all this boasting. But you compelled me. I shouldn't have had to do that. You should have defended me and stood up for me. I have every right to be considered an apostle of God to you. And yet, it's really sad that Paul had to be reduced to doing this kind of thing. Well, that's as far as I'm going to go with these chapters. I hope that's helped you to understand the dynamic of what's happening here. But how could we relate this to ourselves? Is there any applicable lessons in this for us? I think so. Here's a discussion question you could ask after studying this section. What should we do when we encounter others who challenge our beliefs or criticize our leaders and call their authority into question? And then you can try this activity. Sometimes I like to place my students into a hypothetical situation and let them formulate a response. Here's the scenario. Somebody says to them, the church leaders are way out of touch. Their policies are outdated. They're unqualified to teach on certain issues, and they're simply too old to really understand our times. All they really want is to control people and take their money. And you could either have everybody write down their responses and then have them share, or allow some volunteers to respond vocally. And what you'll probably hear are some really strong testimonies of the brethren and the value and guidance that they provide us. And then conclude with your fervent testimony of the prophets and apostles and how they've blessed you. And to speak to this myself, I sometimes feel Paul's same exasperation with members of the church that so quickly seem to suffer fools. They've spent their whole lives being taught the truth, having spiritual experiences, understanding the doctrines of the gospel, having their prayers answered. And then they decide to throw all of that away and dismiss everything they've ever learned because some stranger on the internet throws an argument at them that they don't know how to answer. Are you really going to give up all you've known and been taught by people who love you and have served you for a faceless faith shaker on the other end of the internet? Now, I'm not saying that we should hide from these arguments or that we need to be afraid of them or that doubt is a disease to be avoided at all costs. I just hope that we can be the types that aren't so easily dissuaded from the path that we have tread for so long. Like Jeffrey R. Holland said, Brothers and sisters, this is a divine work in process, with the manifestations and blessings of it abounding in every direction. So please don't hyperventilate if from time to time issues arise that need to be examined, understood, and resolved. They do, and they will. In this church, what we know will always trump what we do not know. And remember, in this world, everyone is to walk by faith. So when the false prophets and the grievous wolves and the chiefest apostles of the world come after you with their boasting and commending themselves and their criticisms of the brethren, please take it in stride. I've read all the arguments. I've been through the anti-stuff. And you know what? I've never encountered the smoking gun, the damning proof, the undeniable evidence that what I believe is not true. There are some good questions out there, and there's issues that I still wrestle with. But I'm not going to turn my back on my faith because I can't explain a few complicated issues out there. It's like doing a puzzle. You start with the corners, then the border. That's the fundamental principles and doctrines of the gospel. And then you start to lump together similar-looking pieces and start to fill in the center. But sometimes you find a piece that just doesn't seem to fit anywhere. What do you do? Do you immediately throw out the entire puzzle? Well, the whole thing must be useless. No, no, you set it aside for a time. Not forever. You're not ignoring its existence, but you're putting it on hold for the time being. I suggest that you do that with your faith as well. There are going to be issues and questions that come up that you may not be able to fit into the gospel puzzle at this time. But be patient. Be faithful. I promise you that there will come a day when all of those pieces will fit. Until that day, my advice, act in faith. Well, that's it for this week, fellow teachers. I'd like to give you a specific challenge this week. 
If you're really finding value in these videos, I challenge you to share this with at least one person that you know that you feel it might help. A family member, a ward member, uh, or a friend that could maybe use some scriptural enlightenment. I'd love these to be able to reach as many people as possible. You can just hit the share button down below and to the right. Also, if you'd like a printable lesson plan with the ideas presented here, it's available at this website. And if you're interested in using the PowerPoint slides that were used to make this video, they're available at this website. Both links are in the video description below. Thank you for watching, and as always, get out there and teach with power.